go back to our top story, as it's emerged as, as the show's been on air this morning, largely because of your reaction to it. It's this group of MPs who've said that there should be no more all-lane smart motorways until the safety risks have been addressed. The Environment Secretary, George Eustace, joins us now. Um, Mr Eustace, uh, this is a big story in the papers today, as I'm sure you're aware. This is the first time that, that the government has been advised to step back from this whole idea of smart motorways. The response, I must tell you, that we have had from our viewers, and I promise you, sir, that we are not exaggerating this, mm. has been massive. We have had endless hair-raising accounts of people who've been stranded in what used to be the hard shoulder, the safe hard shoulder, and is now a live lane, and people have felt that they've been dicing with death. Mm. I, I mean, I won't go through all the examples, but they are absolutely spine-chilling. Um, and our viewers, certainly, I haven't read one, one email or one tweet that says that we should continue unrolling smart motorways. They want their hard shoulders back. Are they going to get them? Well, look, this report's obviously just come out, and I know that my, uh, my colleague Grant Shapps is obviously going to look very closely at what's recommended. The government will always uh, you know, respond to these uh, reports, having considered what's in there. I think they do raise um, you know, some, some quite serious issues around uh, you know, perceived safety. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that those are addressed. But I, I'm afraid at this stage, I'm, I'm unable to, to say exactly what will happen. The government's only just received this report, sure. but we'll obviously consider its contents very carefully. But, but presumably, you would share everybody's deep concern at, at well-testified reports that many of the security cameras, which are supposed to alert the central authority governing that stretch of the motorway to a breakdown in what is actually now a live lane. Those cameras don't work. They're pointing in the wrong direction. We've had endless accounts of people who've, who've nearly hit somebody who's been stranded in a live lane. They've gone on to another spot, a safe spot, and they've phoned in, uh, and they were the person to raise the alarm. Um, and there were no signs warning them that the lane was, was, was blocked ahead. Um, it's clearly not fit for purpose, is it? Well, clearly, if those accounts are true, then, uh, you know, there are some issues about the way uh, that's working, because uh, it is supposed to be the case that, that those cameras uh, pick up uh, any incident or pick up a car that's had to pull over onto the inside uh, lane and then uh, immediately, obviously, close the lane with signage further back to, um, to take people out of that lane. That's what's supposed to happen. Well, happen. If, that's not, if that's not happening, obviously, that is uh, quite a serious issue, and it's something that I know the Department for Transport and Highways England will really want to be looking at closely. Well, listen, we, we spoke to the widow of one man who was killed in one of these incidents. As you know, there have been dozens of people who've been killed, and the pattern is always the same. They break down, they can't reach a so-called safe area, one of these, one of these lay bys which are installed because they're too far apart. They have an instant breakdown, an electrical fault, a tyre blows or something, and before they can get out of the car, they're struck from behind. And that is exactly what happened to Claire Mercer's husband about two and a half years ago. And this is what she told us earlier on this programme. They were stranded in, live, in a live running lane. A HGV came along and uh, ploughed into them because HGVs can't manoeuvre in the same distance that a Fiat 500 can. There was ne it never stood a chance. So it ploughed into them, killed them instantly, and even when they were dead across all four lanes of the road and it was a scene of utter carnage, even then the technology didn't pick them up. It relied on members of the public phoning in. They were dead on the road for six minutes before the road was even closed. Um, I haven't grieved. We're two and a half years down the line, and I haven't grieved. I, the, the campaign is a deflection. You know, I've had two years of counselling to tell me that. Um, but it, at least we're achieving something, you know. And I, I don't know when and if I'll ever get to grieve, but hopefully this is stopping it happening to other people because the Highways England had a very definite policy of not educating the public because then they can't object to what they don't know about. So we've had to educate the public. We had leaflets translated into 10 languages. We have campaigned tireless, tirelessly for two years. I have spent a lot of my own money on this. We just, I've given up my job. I just do this, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. And, Minister, we have had scores of people, well, more than scores, hundreds of people contacting us saying that, that they are either themselves disabled or their partner or their mm. child is disabled. And it is impossible if you break down in one of these live lanes that used to be the safe hard shoulder to get the wheelchair over the barrier. Uh, also, parents saying that they have four children in the car and it takes them ages to get them all unbuckled and unstrapped and over the barrier. And, and every second that they're stuck in that formerly safe lane, now a live lane, they, they, are, they feel mortally at risk. Now, I do appreciate that you have to have time um, to absorb this report, but it really, is, it really is looking as if we're going to have to change policy on this, isn't it? I mean, faced with these stories. 
Well, look, the, the, the tragedy uh, of the, the person you just had interviewed, it, it, that's obviously uh, deeply, deeply sad. And, and if there's um, an issue that, that's around those, um, uh, the, those smart motorways and the way that the technology and the lanes work that's contributed to that, mm. I'm sure there'd obviously be an inquest that would look at that. But more importantly, uh, if we do need to review this policy, it is something that the government will take very seriously. I know that Grant Shapps, my colleague in the Department for Transport, you know, isn't just going to sort of uh, you know, dismiss this report. He was going to look at this uh, very seriously. It raises some important issues around safety, uh, and the government will treat it with the seriousness that it deserves. Do you get the impression, George Eustace, as a government minister, senior government minister, do you get the impression that the government is having second thoughts about smart motorways? Well, look, I'll be honest, this report's only just come out. Um, it's landed on the uh, desk, I think, just yesterday of the Department for Transport. They'll obviously consider it carefully. I've not discussed the issue of smart motorways uh, with, uh, with my uh, ministerial colleagues on this, so I, I don't know what their thoughts are on this matter. I'll be very uh, honest about that. You know, the concept behind smart motorways had been, you know, to bring an extra uh, lane uh, into use and use technology because... The argument had been that as cars get better, more reliable, um, the hard shoulder actually wasn't really being used very much. Of course, so there will be times when people do have a breakdown or a blowout and, uh, on their tyres when they do need to pull over. And it's very important that the technology supports that to make sure that they're safe in those, uh, in those sorts of situations. And have you driven on one? Of course, yes. And um, how I've do you driven... feel when you're driving on one? Well, I've never broken down on one, and I, I think... Um, the, the, the issue clearly is if people break down. I think if you're just driving on it and you haven't broken down, mm. uh, you wouldn't have reason to feel uh, actually, uh, I'll unsafe. Interrupt. It I'll interrupt. Like Sorry, Mr. Hughes, I'll interrupt. The, the problem is, firstly, if you break down, secondly, if you don't see the breakdown. Mm. So, actually, it's a concern for every single person driving on a Absolutely smart motorway right. mm. because you don't just fear getting hit. You fear hitting another car. And it's a level of fear that shouldn't be introduced on a motorway. Yeah, yeah. And I think all of our viewers who are getting in touch say, please, as the government, do reconsider smart motorways because they don't feel smart at well, the moment. Well, look, full disclosure, I've, I've, I'll, I'll cough up to this happily. I've, I've been campaigning about this in my own newspaper, in my own column, for the last two or three years. I, I think this has been a scandal um, that's been in the making, and I've seen more deaths since I started my own campaign. Uh, the Daily Mail, too, uh, has, uh, has been running a campaign and would join that, and, and they're claiming victory for their campaign this well, morning. Well, hang on, before we mm. let go of George Eustace, sorry. Oh, all right, sorry. I was just going to pass um, uh, Mr Eustace, I just I do need to ask you a little bit about um, COP26. Uh, because uh, there is another transport issue going on, which is that Boris Johnson is flying um, back from Glasgow uh, to London rather than getting the train. Now, isn't there a little bit of irony <laughs> in the fact that he has told this roundtable of leaders of developing nations when it comes to tackling climate change, words without action, without deeds, are absolutely pointless? Isn't he describing himself there? Well, look, I, I think what he was um, appealing in his opening speech was that governments had to set ambitious targets to uh, reduce our carbon emissions, to tackle climate change and put in place the policies to do that. And that can be decarbonising your energy supply. Uh, it can be um, decarbonising uh, transport. It needs um, governments to take the right policy steps to get there. Of course, when you do events okay, of this not, sort... It's not... But OK, it's, but it's about... Your actions, not just your words. It's all very well for us to lecture other people on the policies that they should introduce. But if actually then you get into a form of transport which has multiple carbon emissions to an alternative you could have taken simply because you haven't got the time to take the greener alternative, it just undermines everything we're trying to do, doesn't it? Well, look, I, I understand that people will uh, sometimes make that point. The, the point I'd make is a broader one, which is um, the world has to come together and, and take some quite, um, make some quite ambitious commitments to reduce our carbon emissions, to tackle climate change, and then to have the policy agenda behind it. To, to get that commitment, you need countries to be able to come together at events like this to agree these things. Uh, yes, of course, that necessitates that people will have to fly to a, a venue to take part uh, in the conference. But if we can get the right outcomes from this, the right commitments to reduce carbon emissions, uh, then it will be a, an event it, okay. that but is worthwhile it, that delivers what we want. But Mr Eustace isn't tackling climate change 
all about very difficult individual decisions, which are very often inconvenient. And if we don't each of us do those things, then, you know, as a, as a Prime Minister, what he's saying is do as I say, not as I do. Well, we're not, actually. I mean, we're, we're, what, we're, what we're saying to world leaders who are coming to this summit is we need world leaders and governments around the world to make ambitious commitments and then we need them to have the policy agenda to deliver it. Um, you know, we're not lecturing people uh, on what they should do. In fact, the way we will tackle climate change often is by deploying the right kind of uh, technologies, making the right policy decisions to enable us to get there. Uh, everybody's got a, a role to play. There are things that they can do. But this conference is principally uh, about getting world leaders to make the right commitments and implement yeah. the right policies. Well, very, very quickly, uh, back to the politics of the person, as I often say on the show. You're due up in Glasgow shortly. Uh, how are you going to get there and how are you going to get back? I'll be going by train. You won't be flying? I won't be flying. And what about coming back? I'll be getting the train back. OK. Do you think, do you think Mr Johnson should be doing the same thing? Well, look, um, obviously with the Prime Minister, uh, there are different issues, different considerations, uh, pressures on his diary, security issues and all sorts of other uh, things that have to be taken into account. Um, uh, you know, I don't make uh, decisions about his travel arrangements, but I know uh, clearly it's, it's more complex for him than it would be for me. But certainly all other ministers were all um, uh, travelling by uh, train to, to get there. That's, um, that's what we're encouraging everybody to do. All right, Minister, thank you very much indeed for your time thank this morning. You. Appreciate it.